Hello, everyone. Can you guys hear me okay? I had to fire up Firefox because Chrome wasn't with the video and the audio. Hopefully, it's coming out of this mic. Thank you, Vova. Good. So it's two o'clock. I will, uh, yeah, I'll get uh, get started now. So obviously, this is this Q and A is related to the course. If you haven't seen it, making pro plugins, but it's going to be a really soft pitch. I'm not looking to to hard pitch with this. I'm just open to answer some questions and answer uh, anything that you guys have have posted on there. And if you want to grab the course, great. There's a discount until uh, until tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern. But if not, that's totally cool. So we'll start with the first one. So Kevin asked, uh, how well do you need to know the inner workings of WordPress? So this is kind of assuming either you're new to WordPress development or maybe you are you know, a PHP developer and you haven't done WordPress or you haven't done any PHP or WordPress at all. Kind of depends on the plugin, obviously. If you're doing something that's you know front end heavy, or uh, maybe is you know changing the internals of WordPress and how plugins are installed, or something like that, like you know something like WP Pusher, you're obviously going to need to know more of the inner workings of WordPress. But uh, a lot of times, it's just really knowing PHP and kind of as you're developing the plugin, you kind of want to think, okay, if I'm going to add this thing in, do I need to know, um, you know, like is there a WordPress way of doing this? And, you know, A, a lot of stuff that you can do with WordPress is with hooks and filters. So you definitely need to check those out. And I've actually got a video on YouTube, which I can post later, that goes through uh, the basics of actions and hooks and filters in WordPress, which you can do a ton of. Uh, there's obviously other resources. I've got some other WordPress.tv presentations on kind of the inner workings of WordPress and and ways you can create those plugins. Um, I also have a free JS course, uh, so WordPress and JavaScript that you can check out over on brianhog.com. So that'll also teach you some of the more inner workings of WordPress and how to properly enqueue JavaScript files and all that good stuff. So yeah, definitely check out those resources. But again, depends on the plugin, but always ask, is there a WordPress way of doing this as you're kind of creating that plugin? So there you go. So the next one is from myself. Thanks, Brian. Who uh, basically to feed the feed the questions in there? So I was basically saying, you know, can you build and run it uh, WordPress plus on the side? And the answer is absolutely. So I built up over the last year and a half, two years uh, the couple plugins that I have, and now I have three. And you can absolutely do it on the side. It's usually a, a slow build, you know, unless it goes viral and you get tens of thousands of users in a month. Uh, but that's extremely rare. Usually it'll be a, a pretty slow build. And um, yeah, I mean, you just time block. If you're going to do support, you don't have to reply immediately. Like even if you can just do it one day a week, then just block out that time, a couple hours a week or so to A, do support, work on the plugin uh, and, and chip away at it. Like you don't want to burn yourself out and work crazy hours, you know, and, and try and get it out in a week or two um, and then not be able to sustain that momentum, right? So definitely block out as much as you can. Start small. You know, you don't need to have this mega monolithic plugin. The quicker you can get it out there, the better. And yeah, just handle things like support by just time blocking a bit and, uh, and doing it that way. So absolutely can run on the side. No problem at all. So the next one, how much, uh, so for Michael Buck B, uh, how much support time does kind of a sale typically involve? So right now, I mean, when it first started, a lot of the stuff that would come out would be, uh, you know, a lot of the questions that would come in would be stuff that, you know, was stuff that should, probably should be in the documentation. So I just make a habit that as the support question came in, I tried to make sure that it was added to the documentation. And then as I replied, I would send them a link. And then over time that built up such that a lot of people could find the answers that they needed. If the same question kept coming up over and over again, uh, a couple ones would, would be, you know, like how to install the plugin, how to take that zip file and upload it. So a lot of times you would you need to go in and and change how the onboarding process is, and even just adding a note to the payment receipt. Here's how you install the plugin. You know, uh, plugins add new, upload the zip file. 
And, you know, you just find the questions that you get over and over again. You want to either make sure it's, you know, in the documentation or you're changing your user interface. So it's just obvious and they don't even need to look at the documentation. But I would say right now it's about one in every 10 to 15 sales uh, that generate a support ticket. And usually it's something pretty small where I just point them to an existing uh, piece of documentation and uh, that's it. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's probably about, you know, five or six a week or, or less, uh, on average, uh, support tickets. And yeah, a lot of them are, are quite quick. So hasn't been, uh, hasn't been too bad. So the next one, so how do you, uh, decide on what features go into the free and what goes into the pro? So I see Vova posted a link on how to decide a free and pro plugin features, which is awesome. And actually I have a whole video on it in, um, in the course, but it's, it's essentially you take, take the list of the features that you have in the plugin and, and then go through and see which one should be free and pro. You never want to take something out of the free ever. Um, I did it once and I felt horrible about it. Plus someone called me out on it. It was like the drop down list for the event calendar newsletter, basically showing, uh, or, or allowing to pick a smaller time period. And yeah, obviously I put it right back in immediately. So once it's in the free, you can never take it out. So if you're unsure as to whether it should go in the free versus the pro, you definitely want to keep it in uh, the pro version only and then crank it into the free later uh, if you need. You definitely want to have something that's a quote unquote essential feature. So obviously this should get use out of the plugin, the free version and be able to try a good chunk of it. But anything, it, there needs to be something that's like quote unquote essential to uh, the you know functionality. Otherwise, there's going to be a very low you know reason for them to upgrade essentially. And I kind of made this mistake a little bit with the event calendar newsletter plugin, where you know I, I didn't really have in my mind to do a pro version at all at the beginning. And again, because the features were already in the version. I'm not going to be able to, you know, take them out and just make them pro only unless maybe I took the free version off completely, but really you're, you're, you're just going to want to make a list, you know, figure out which ones, uh, make sense to have in the free that are just, you know, absolute minimum functionality and then keep everything else, uh, in the pro. Um, one of the note as well is to, you know, like if there's uh, well, one suggestion or some good examples of what people have done to separate the free and the pro one is uh, MailChimp for WordPress. So they've got a, um, you know, the ability to create one sign up form for WordPress and, or for MailChimp. And if you want to add more than one, then you're essentially going to want to, um, you know, upgrade like it's, but you can at least create one, see how it works, make sure it works. And then if you just want to add more than one on the same site, you're going to want to upgrade. Another good example is Ultimate Coming Soon. So they've got um, like a Coming Soon plugin where it shows a splash page. And one of their things is the gateways that they allow you to collect email addresses from, right? So they've got like FeedBurner or something is their free version, which nobody uses. I don't even know if that's a thing anymore. And if you want to use something like MailChimp or whatever, you're going to have to upgrade. So uh, those are a couple of really good examples on separating the free and the pro. And uh, yeah, I'm sure there's some other insights in Vova's article right there. So there you go. So the next one. Uh, so what are your thoughts on kind of a paid only versus uh, free or paid upgrade and extensions? So, so I mean, <laughs> Mike says, yeah, feed burner is not a thing. So yeah, but that, that's the only option you got on that one. I don't know why. So yeah. So essentially what are the thoughts on, on free only or paid only versus a free and paid upgrade? So in the course I go through essentially either having one pro version or a bundle. So with, you know, things like EDD, you can actually separate out the features that are in your paid version by, you know, say level if you want. So if they have the lower level, then they only get certain features. If they get the mid level, they get uh, some more, et cetera, or you just have one pro version. Um, most people I've talked to who have add-ons, kind of regret doing it. A, it's a lot harder to market because now you've got, okay, you've got your free version, you've got your bundles, uh, you're going to have to, uh, you know, put in, uh, you know, like you're going to, people are going to have to figure out, okay, uh, so I'm going to start with this free version and then I'm going to need this one, this one, maybe this one, I'm not really sure. 
what's that going to, you know, they're, they're figuring out permutations. It's like, okay, if I get these three, but not these other five, how much is it going to cost? Oh, there's a bundle of these add-ons too. Like, what does that include? And what am I saving? So, I mean, setting up the whole marketing for it is, is possible, but it's just a lot more complicated. Um, so I would definitely recommend starting with, you know, just kind of a bundled version. And actually there's a great article that uh, Delicious Brains did on, you know, they do, the bundled and and the uh, you know kind of single pro version uh, model as opposed to the add-ons, and they do a nice breakdown of uh, you know which ones uh, better or worse. So I'll link that in the comments afterwards. So there's that. So the next one. So in your opinion, what would another worthwhile CMS be to consider? premium plugins for and this is assuming in addition to wordpress so actually this came up uh, yesterday uh was it eric davis who's kind of known for doing redmine uh, consulting and, and and writing a book on that a lot of ruby stuff and he just got into using or doing shopify add-ons so that's kind of another platform uh and, and you know cms of sorts that it has a marketplace, has a lot of active users, and uh, where he's able to get a lot of organic traffic through that. You know, people searching for add-ons and then finding it. It's kind of nice too because there's a. It's kind of baked in. You know, e-commerce. I believe I haven't written Shopify plugins, but you're able to do like monthly fees, and I'm pretty sure if you stop paying, then it just automatically removes it from the site. Versus WordPress, it would stay. You know, as a plugin installed, and then you'd either either they would just keep using it, and it just wouldn't be supported anymore. Or they would, uh, you know, the, or you'd have to deactivate the features by checking that the license is still valid. So, um, yeah, Shopify is one of them. But to be honest, I haven't really looked at other ones. Like, you know, I, I don't know if Drupal has like a marketplace. I think that took me, what, six weeks to set up a basic blog. And then when Drupal upgraded from seven to, to eight, like you'd have to like redo it again because it's not backward compatible. So, uh, uh, yeah, definitely WordPress uh, has been the main one because uh, it's just a, there's a huge market for it. And uh, they're pretty good for better, or for worse of keeping things backward compatible. So um, you're able to kind of do a lot less support, which is good uh, as the WordPress versions upgrade and a lot less maintenance. You just have to test to make sure it still works. So there you go. All right. So Aaron asks, what is the best way to get ideas for plugins that would actually sell? So a lot of times, you know, I again got a video on this and um, it's on YouTube and I've sent it by the by the email. But uh, you basically want to, you know, one idea is to scratch your own niche. So you know, it typically if you can use in it something you can use and you think it's better than than things that are already out there, chances are there are other people who can use it as well. If there's a plugin you've created for a client or something that you think a client would benefit from, then that's obviously a great way to do it. They can even become your first customer. So, you know, if you can basically say, hey, you know, it's either you've started, I've started creating this plugin and, and uh, you know, and I want to uh, put it out there. Is it something you're interested in? Yes. They say yes. And oh, cool. Well, here's, uh, you know, do you know, do you want to pay by Visa or MasterCard? Like actually ask for their payment right there. If they kind of go, oh, yeah, then maybe they weren't, you know, they were just appeasing you and it wasn't actually something that they were looking for. But they can definitely be your your first client and your, your kind of feature client, an ideal person who's going to be using that plugin. And they can help direct some of the features and stuff as they use it and as it benefits kind of their their business. Um so yeah, so that's that's one idea. Uh, talking about it to people as well. I mean, like if you talk to people and and you know describe your plugin, and they're just like, yeah, that would be a great idea. I haven't really you know seen anything that does a lot of that stuff, and you might be onto something. If they're kind of going, yeah, you know, whatever, and you can't really find anyone that's excited about that kind of plugin, it's or it's not uh, not a great idea. So scratching your own itch, uh, talking about it with other people because there's really no point in hiding. Uh, you know, any ideas that you have, it, it's best to just be open and honest and get early feedback before you even start coding. And uh, it's, even if it's not your own itch, if it's something that your clients, if you built for your clients or something that you think they could use, then that's uh, a great way to do it. And then that gives you a vertical too that you can kind of market to a bit easier uh, in addition to, you know, creating a free version and uh, getting stuff from there. All right. So the next question. So 
Uh, so Derek asks, how do you deal with WordPress licensing uh, that basically requires you to make the plugin free and the code is essentially being readable and copyable? So for those who aren't familiar, WordPress is GPL, which means that you, uh, you know, the code, by the, because it's a plugin that depends on WordPress, the PHP code that's within it automatically becomes GPL as well. So that means anyone can obviously read the code, uh, they can copy it, they can use it in their own plugins and whatever. So when you're selling a plugin, you're essentially selling where a support and the ability to upgrade automatically within it if you add software licensing. So that's uh, the main reason for it. You can, if you want, um, you know, PHP is really the main thing that needs to be GPL. Everything needs to be GPL and open source if you're doing a free version on WordPress.org. But if you're doing, excuse me, a uh, paid version, you could ha keep the JavaScript, the CSS, the images, and keep them not GPL. Whether you'd want to do that or not, it's up to you. I, I personally don't think there's there's a whole lot of point in that. If, if someone's going to copy it, that's fine. And if someone's going to copy it and, and steal it, they're probably not going to pay for it anyway. Um, uh, you know, what people are paying for is the support and the upgrades and, you know, the additional features that you get to add over time. So um, to be honest, I really don't worry about it too much. Uh, you know, if someone uh, steals it and, and uses that code, that's fine. Um, you know, but, but it is definitely something to be aware of. And especially if you do have a paid version and it's not 100% GPL, a, the community kind of frowns upon it just because um, like things like WordCamps. You can't sponsor WordCamp. You can't be a speaker at a WordCamp if you have non uh, or, you know, uh, plugins that are not 100% GPL. So, um, yeah, again, I don't really worry about it too much. And I think it's, uh, it's worth just keeping everything 100% GPL. And that also includes any licenses or any libraries that you include. You have to make sure that they're GPL compatible. Uh, when you're adding them into the plugin. All right. Take a quick sip. Getting over a little bit of a cold. I don't sound like this normally on the videos. Actually, it's not too bad right now. All right. So the next one, uh, why use something like easy digital downloads to sell the plugin? I'll be careful. What a, oh, there you go. Oh, thanks, Justin. <laughs> so, uh, so Vova is here, who is from Freemius. So, I'll be careful, uh, careful what I say, but, um, but yeah, so the, the easy digital downloads, I mean, a, it's what I use for my plugins. Um, and it's what I've always used. I did actually try, uh, freemies for a bit and like I had it on the, the free version of the plugin for a while and, uh, had it on there, but, uh, went back to easy digital downloads for a few reasons. One, uh, at the time freemies didn't allow you to, and, and some other solutions that are hosted, didn't allow you to buy from your own site, which now you can. Um, so that's that's definitely an option. But for me, A, I wanted it all on my own site. Um, I wanted full control over the data, which again, you you can get with uh, something like Freemius. Like they have a REST API and uh, you know, you're, you're able to pull the data in, but uh, and, and back it up. So that's your, you know, your license keys, your customer sales data, all that stuff. But then you kind of have to maintain that and, and make sure that it's backing up. And that's not to say, you know, it, like other cloud services, I don't back up all the data from, you know, Stripe and uh, PayPal and stuff like that. Though EDD does have, um, you know, those tokens and, and subscription IDs if you're doing recurring stuff is, is all stored in easy digital downloads. So you do have most of it back up. Um, but just being able to, you know, just install Vault Press or any other backup plugin for WordPress and all of my sales data, which is super important for taxes. I have to keep it archived for what, seven years in Canada, um, you know, is, is all there and, and easy to back up, which is huge. Um, another reason was uh, by having it all in the own site and having it as, you know, an open source WordPress plugin. That way I have all the code and I'm able to take a look at it. Uh, change, you know, whatever uh, I want to uh, by using some of the hooks and filters. Didn't have to change too much, bit of styling and stuff like that. But at least I had the option to do that. And a huge reason is that, you know, if, if uh, you know, Pippin and his team, fingers crossed, touch wood, ever get hit by a bus, you know, or, or there's some issue with, say, easydigitaldownloads.com or whatever, you know, the, the hosting for the site, the my site doesn't get really affected, right? Like uh, my 
website will keep on ticking and it's up to me, you know, just grab some decent quality hosting, you know, like WP Engine or SiteGround or something like that. And then that way I'm able to, yeah. And then Buck B, yeah. So speaking of hosting, like S3 is is down, right? So if if something that's a hosted service depends on S3 or something like that, then you might uh, might be out of luck uh, with that. But um, because it's all on my site and I have full access to the code, it would really suck if I'm now the one who's supporting uh, this e-commerce platform. But at least again, you know, if if it, today Easy Digital Downloads is no longer supported. I'm able to continue using my site and sales will keep coming in and, you know, just eventually I'll have to upgrade if Stripe APIs or PayPal APIs or whatever, or WordPress compatibilities come in. But just having that full control for me is, is a great thing. And obviously DD, uh, Pippin and his team have a, have a great support model. So those are many reasons as to why I picked DDD and kind of highlight that uh, as, as part of the course. Take a quick sip. All right. So, oh, actually one popped up here. I wonder if I can mark these as uh, answered. So if I go start answering, done answering. Hey, there you go. Cool. So I can actually mark them as uh, answered so I don't miss any. Uh, but Mike just posted, so any tips on getting more feedback? feature requests on plugins so you've got a few plugins with 200 active installs but don't get a ton of feedback from users so actually vova wrote an article and a few people have done well with it to prompt users to leave a review and that can obviously prompt them to leave feedback as part of that or just you know realize that they can go to .org and they can submit something in the support forums and provide feedback that way. And the way you do that is, is um, you, you want to have a, a point where you know they've gotten some value out of it. So a good example is the upcoming soon plugin that uh, John Turner over at Cprod did. And he can tell pretty quick, pretty easily, okay, do they have they created a, uh, you know, an upcoming soon splash page and have they activated it? And then he, you know, adds a condition, it's been a day since they've had that active. So that's a pretty easy way to know that they've used the plugin and they've, they've done something with it and they're hopefully getting some value out of it. And then, then he just prompts using a dismissible has to be dismissible admin notice uh, that basically says, you know, look, Hey, looks like you're getting some value from it. Hop over to uh, wordpress.org. We'd love it if you could leave us a review. So that way he can get that, that kind of feedback and, and pull some feedback from that. Freemius does have a uh, free uh, version if you have under 10,000 installs, which we were just posted. Thank you. <laughs> Analytics for plugin developers. So then that way he's able to, uh, you know, it's, it's one way to, without creating your own kind of uh, permission form, because you can't just grab the email uh, address, you know, from the admin and, and throw it onto your server. That's totally against the WordPress.org rules. But that way, uh, A, you can get a little more advanced analytics. You get their email address, and then you can ask for feedback. Uh, typically, when I was using uh, Freemius, I was emailing people and asking for feedback. And to be honest, I didn't really get any uh, replies. Um, but I know others like uh, Sprout Apps. Um, I think he's got his own system where he's explicitly asking for permission and getting their email address. And he's had some pretty good success uh, with asking for feedback that way and just, you know, having a direct line to free users. And you can totally do that. You just have to explicitly ask for permission uh, before you do it. So uh, those are some uh, some good ideas that you can, you can use to get some more feedback. So I can mark that as done. Make sure I didn't miss any above. No, I think we're good. All right, let's scroll back down. All right. So Mike also asked, so do you or can you uh, do a yearly amount or make it like a SaaS, you know, software as a service kind of billing model? So I'm assuming monthly is pretty typical. So depends on the plugin that you're using. So typically WordPress plugins would include and, and what people are used to is having a year of support. So you would have, uh, you know, like one year of, of free upgrades and support. And then after that, you need to renew. A lot of times people offer a discount. Like for myself, I do a 30% discount after the first year. Reason being A, gives them a, you know, an, a little incentive to upgrade. And B, you would also, uh, you know, after the first year, if they've been using it for a year, 
typically it's not like the year mark hits and they go, whoa, I don't know how to use it anymore. You know, they've, they've kind of already been using it. They're familiar with it. They're comfortable with it. So that 30% discount is just basically because support should be significantly less uh, or nil, uh, unlike what it might have been in the first year. So uh, you can do recurring payments. You know, EDD has a recurring payments extension that you can use to automatically bill a year and you should you know definitely make that clear in the terms and conditions that it's a yearly amount and give them a way to cancel pretty easily um but you don't need to do that out of the gate and you can always switch it later after you get it for a few sales you can also do a monthly model um which i know some still do uh, boxzilla and some other ones like boxzilla is like six dollars a month or something um but they, you know, like I, I use that, I, I grabbed the plugin and then I kind of cancel it afterwards. And I'm not sure if they're going to cancel the the features just because I don't need it. it was exit intent or something. And I, I just don't need that anymore because I'm not going to use it. But, um, but yeah, if you're doing a monthly model, you typically want to probably remove those features after that uh, monthly subscription is ended. But it again, it depends on your plugin and uh, and whether you could do that. If it's a plugin that's something like you know Vault Press, which is like a backup plugin, or a Kismet, which is like an anti spam, or well, I guess a lot of it's wrapped into Jetpacks uh, stuff now. Um, then that's like a hosted service, right? So you can totally have a free plugin that's in WordPress.org and it really doesn't do anything until a license key from your SaaS is entered. So basically, your plugin is just an interface between WordPress and your hosted service. And that's totally doable. It's something you can do. It's not something I currently cover in a course, but, um, but yeah, it might be either. You could even be a separate course altogether, turning your plugin into kind of a SaaS billing model. But nope, it's definitely doable. There are a lot of good examples of uh, ones that do that, and uh, you can do it. All right. So I'll kill that. All right. So Derek asks, I've got a plugin I've been building on my own site and my own needs, uh, dealing with e-courses, so screencast books. Uh, he relies heavily on other paid plugins, but he adds his own code to add features to the WordPress site and integrates everything together seamlessly. You know, is there a market and a marketplace for plugins that build upon other plugins uh, to create kind of an integrated feature set like this? So yes, <laughs> there are. Um, obviously, if, especially if you're integrating with more than one, that I would think that would be a lot harder to market and explain. And you know, people might come in and be like, "Oh, well, I use this one premium plugin that you're, you know, tacking extra functionality onto, or or free plugin, depending, but not this other one." You know, does it still work and whatnot? So I mean, if if you're adding functionality onto other plugins. I'd probably limit it to just one plugin at a time. So maybe split up your integration stuff into pieces, right? So if you're adding something to, you know, say EDD even, or you're adding something to uh, something like advanced custom fields or whatever it is that kind of has a large user base, would tend to just have a add-on for that one plugin. Uh, so split up your integration stuff to piece it out so that each add-on or integration plugin that you've created only depends on one plugin at a time, but there's definitely a market for that. And a lot of things like, you know, for example, Event Espresso, I have a support for and Event Calendar Newsletter. And I was able to get listed on their, you know, third party integrations page and get some traffic from that. So um, yeah, by having it be an add-on on on another plugin, it's kind of nice because A, you know, there's a lot of people, you know, like Advanced Custom Fields is over a million installs. Uh, ADD is 60,000 on their free version, right? So, you know, there's already a base of people who are using that plugin and are probably looking for that kind of add-on. So, it can be a great way to, you know, relatively easily add a bit of functionality and spin it out as an add-on that's, you know, totally independent from that plugin, but uh, something that you can even reach out to. And even before you start building it or, or thinking of marketing it, I mean, reach out and be like, hey, I built this kind of integration. Is it something that you'd be interested in uh, helping me market or, or promoting to your users? And a lot of times they'll they'll say yes. Um, I've done that before with like, you know, a theme that I support on one of my plugins and uh, and they've they put it out in their newsletter to a lot of people. So yeah, it can be a great marketing tool to to do it and leverage that existing audience and kind of user base uh, who who might be interested in your plugin. So hopefully that answers that question. All right. 
So do you ever think about vulnerabilities your code may introduce to WordPress site? <laughs> so I, I wasn't before, but now I am. Thank you. <laughs> Um, yeah, so no, it's, it's definitely something I, I consider. I try to follow, you know, as, as best practices as much as I can. Um, there's a whole module actually in the WordPress, uh, JavaScript course that's on my site, brianhog.com on creating a endpoint with the WP REST API and making sure that the data that's coming in and going out is validated and sanitized, um, that you're checking for appropriate permissions, you know, making sure that they're logged in, making sure that they're an administrator if they need to be. Um, using things like nonce. Uh, so that's a number used once, even though it's kind of a crappy name because it's never, it's not actually used once. It's used for 24 hours over and over again. Um, but at least that gives a little less ability for someone to spoof, you know, like a, a cookie or, or fake that they're a logged in user. And uh, because that's unique to, you know, a specific person and everything is <laughs> day once. Yeah, <laughs> we should suggest that at the next thing instead of nonce. <laughs> um, so, yeah, so that's uh, so those are ways that you can kind of prevent a lot of the a lot of the, uh, you know, potential vulnerabilities that come in if you're doing any kind of Ajax stuff in your code. Um, there was a good example. I'll see if I can find uh, find it where it was. But someone actually released a plugin is kind of an exercise. I think he works for automatic. I'm pretty sure. And, uh, basically put it out there and said, look, here's a plugin. There's a whole bunch of vulnerabilities that are in it, go through and find where those vulnerabilities are. And it was things like, uh, the database, right? So it was inserting or modifying data in the database without actually checking and, and, and sanitizing the data that's coming in, which is obviously a huge vulnerability and it can, you know, affect any data that's in the WordPress site. Um, and there was a, a bunch of other, uh, things that he went through. So yeah, exercises like that can be great to, uh, to, to do it. And, you know, like I've done security audits for, for other plugins. And so getting someone who does, you know, security audits for, for your plugin can be a great way if, if you're concerned, uh, to, to kind of get it checked out by, uh, a second set of eyes and see if there's any vulnerabilities that they can find. And a lot of times as well, if you go to like WordPress meetups and stuff, um, you know, a lot, of, a lot of developers have fun trying to find uh, find bugs and vulnerabilities and stuff. So um, that's going to be a nice way to to get someone to kind of check it out for free. So yeah, let me see if I can find that uh, find that thing. I'll I'll leave that unanswered so I remember to go back. All right. So next question. Is how do you get your first 10 customers. So kind of related to the question before on, you know, how do you come up with an idea that'll actually get money? So if it's something that's, you know, scratching your own itch or you're scratching the itch of a client, then a lot of times, you know, the clients and, and people that they know can be great first customers. Um, otherwise you can do, you know, having a free version is how I got a lot of my first 10 customers. So by having that free version and then adding links from the free version to the pro in kind of a nice subtle way, like you, don't want to be like totally in their face and on every single page be like upgrade now you know you want to give them a chance to use it and uh, and and see your free version and then discover the features of the pro version over time um but that's how i got you know my first 10 customers and and some of them before i even had a pro version they would be asking in the free version you know can it do this and they'd be like oh uh, not yet <laughs> but it will in the pro version later and uh, and stuff like that so then i you know had their emails and i was able to, to email them so the free version can be a great way to to get those first 10 customers uh otherwise you just do stuff like you know you have if you just have a pro version only then it could be content marketing a lot of premium plugin uh, authors don't really do too much content marketing beyond how to tutorials and documentation which can be a great way to do it especially if you do it on like something like youtube uh, and people can find it that way so that's another way to do it and just you know like looking for for either Facebook groups or blog posts and whatnot of people who are struggling with some of the issues that your plugin might address and just, you know, not spamming or anything and, and dropping the link to your plugin everywhere, but just, you know, being helpful and replying and being like, look, you know, if, if it's something that you're interested uh, in, uh, the plugin can solve X, Y, Z for you and feel free to ask me any questions about it. So if you have a pro only version, that can be another way to get some of those uh, first and customers. If that one helps. All right. 
So another one uh, was how does a building launching a plugin suite, so like WooCommerce plus free paid add-ons, uh, differ from the likes of a freemium model, like a basic custom field or premium only model like WP Rocket. Um, so I kind of addressed this a little bit in my preference for having, you know, a bundled version as opposed to free and paid add-ons. Um, but I mean, a lot of it can can come out of having the free version first, if that's something you want to do, especially if you've already got the plugin out there and you think you just want to release it for free and see if people are interested in it as a way to, to test kind of the market. Then you can release that free version, see what the feedback is, see what people ask for. And if they're small enough chunks, then maybe it's something that you just release as kind of a little add-on and stuff like that. But again, it just a lot more complicated to set up a uh, market, set up a marketing site, you know, can add a lot of confusion if like people have like three out of the 10 add-ons and they've got all these different license keys that they have to kind of manage with it. EDD is an example of this. I mean, if you ask Pippin, he would totally be like, I wish that I had not, you know, had bundles as opposed to individual add-ons just because of the uh, additional support and stuff that I can, uh, that can add both on the maintenance side and the, on the customer support side. Um, but otherwise, yeah, I mean, you, you set up the, the freemium model and, and test the market and see if people are interested in it. Otherwise, you know, like premium only, a good example is uh, Justin Fairman uh, from LearnDash, who I interviewed as part of the course. And, you know, he was working full time as a consultant in the e-learning space. And he's not a developer. And he had someone create the first version of LearnDash, which is like a learning management system and the one that I use for the uh, for the course. And he's just like, I, I just, you know, I, I'm working full time, um, you know, and, and just I only want to support people who are giving me money for it. It, it was a bit slower of a build uh, for it, but because he was consulting in that domain and had clients uh, in that domain, you know, that's just it was just a great way to get started. And, you know, when a new client came along or it made sense for an existing client, he was able to be like, oh, look, I've got this, you know, WordPress learning management system that I've created. You know, I think it'll solve a lot of what you're looking for. And, you know, then that client could go and uh, through word of mouth, essentially, be able to find that premium only version and be able to purchase it and use it. And then he can obviously layer consulting on top of that, which if you're up doing customization or consulting, uh, freelancing, whatever, on top of uh, your plugin can again be a great way to add additional revenue uh, whether you just have a premium only version or you have a uh, freemium or free only so um yeah it really depends on uh what plugin you're you're looking to do but hope that helps all right so let me do this uh, answering all right so I'll leave that there. All right. So Justin asks, how crucial is visibility in the WordPress plugin directory? Uh, you know, what is the best way to distribute uh, a light version? So, I mean, you're basically like that is, I mean, WordPress.org is by far the best way to distribute a light version. Um, some people do it a uh, combination, right? So they'll have a light version and then they'll actually create a landing page or a method, you know, like, like promote it on their website and be like here's a free version but through that process get their email address uh through you know like a pop-up or whatever edd is a great example of this they have some free add-ons and if you go and grab them it'll uh ask for the email address first even though it's something you can just find in the wordpress.org repository they'll ask for the email address and then uh you know and then give you the link to download it from wordpress.org but absolutely, if, if you can, if it fits the criteria and I've got a whole video and I mean, you can look up as well some of the restrictions with listing in the WordPress.org repository, but that can be uh, by far the best way to get visibility and, and distribution for a light version of the plugin. And I mean, I know some people do a lot of different, you know, SEO tactics and and, and try to gain game the, you know, WordPress plugin directory uh, using different tags or, or, you know, maybe using tags that another competing plugin uses to try and steal visibility from them. It's really not that they're starting to crack down on that kind of stuff. So um, really keeping the plugin updated, uh, making sure that, you know, it's a pretty clear, especially the short description of the plugin like you want it to just be a pretty concise explanation of what your plugin does and what the benefit you know the the end result of installing that plugin will be and just make sure that's really clear 
um, you know, uh, it wants to get a few reviews that can obviously help with it. And you can use that technique of kind of asking them for reviews somehow in the free version uh, in a dismissible way. So it's not like something they can't get rid of uh, that you're asking them. And um, yeah, just keeping it updated, like making sure that at least even if your plugin still works with the latest version of WordPress, make sure that you've updated the readme such that it says, yes, it works with uh, version 4.7.2. Because otherwise people, when they go to search for it and they go to plugins that new, then they'll see that, oh, this isn't compatible with the latest version of WordPress. And it may still totally work, but that's totally a red flag for most people to actually install a plugin on their site. So, um, yeah, I think it's, if you're going to have a late version, you definitely want to try and get it or, or get it into the plugin directory if you can. And there's some stories I went through, uh, the one story was a WP pusher. It was one where, uh, you know, you had it in the free repository, the uh, plugin directory. And then about a week later or so it got removed. He's like, crap, is this a joke? You know, like I was, uh, what, what's going on? And it's because one of the uh, rules of the WordPress.org uh, directories that you're not supposed to change how things like you know plugins or themes are installed which wp pusher did um so unfortunately it wasn't able to be in the directory uh, but he got some you know some coverage i guess from this experience and uh, has made a decent uh you know go at the pro version of that plugin because of it but um yeah i definitely if you can have a free version absolutely i would list in the, the directory and just have some reasonable tags and uh and a good short description and that's uh the best way you can get some visibility on it so there's that all right so i think one jumped up yeah there we go uh actually i'll close that one as well all right. So when starting a new freemium plugin, hosting it in the repository or plugin directory, uh, what sort of download install trajectory would seem reasonable? Uh, you know, so for example, how many active installs should be aiming for after one month, six months, et cetera. Um, so, I mean, if you look at event calendar newsletter, it's, you know, after a couple of years, it's still at the like 600 level uh, active users uh, total. And, um, and I'm still getting, you know, decent uh, you know, conversions, like, Definitely more than the five percent freemium goal of uh, and and actually when someone because of the way I've set it up and the way I go through in the course, they uh, it it takes away from like anyone who buys the pro version takes away from the free because you're uninstalling the free version to install the pro, but that's fine. It's uh, other plugins like WP Touch and whatnot do that as as well. Um, but no, I mean it depends. Like obviously, the more that you have, the better. And, you know, if you look at some like John Turner, right, there was, it was a couple of years ago, but he was able to get, you know, 10,000, uh, inst active installs within, um, you know, within a month, I think, which was definitely a lot higher than, uh, than normal. But, um, but no, I mean, you should definitely hopefully break over the more than 10 <laughs> within a month or two that kind of starts to show that there's some, uh, some, you know, trajectory on there. And, and again, you know, you should be talking to people about the fact that you have this again. And, um, you know, if it's something that your clients can use, you should be adding it on their sites, obviously to increase that. But, uh, but no, there's no like set trajectory or, or, you know, numbers that every plugin, uh, should aim for. Um, like I said, you know, some very low or relatively low, uh, active install amounts can still generate a pretty decent, uh, decent income. If again, you're keeping some of those core or quote unquote required features out of the free version and making them into the pro. So here's my answer for that one. I think that might be it. Unless one jumped out into the top. Cool. Okay. So I'll try and find that, um, that link for the, yeah, that vulnerability uh question that i had yeah because it was it was a neat exercise actually like he actually took the submissions there was like a form you could submit it to i mean this is a while back um but it was a really good exercise of finding those vulnerabilities and stuff so yeah like i said i mean i hopefully this has been of uh of help um i've got the the course if you're interested in, in learning some of the stuff over at making pro and uh yeah i hope this has been, uh, been a lot of help appreciate all the questions and thanks again